Well, we're talking about lumber today with Simon from Uneducated Economist. And don't let the name fool you. Simon knows a lot and he's very close to the source on this topic. The price of lumber, if in case you didn't know, has just been going bananas for a couple years and especially over the last year. And it's doing that for lots of reasons. And it's really interesting. And nobody knows exactly what's happening next. But Simon's really close to it. And he talks about it on his YouTube channel and in his podcast. And you may have seen his name and face pop up in your feed. So I know you'll enjoy it. We start the conversation talking a little bit about his background and how he got interested in economics. But for the most part, we're talking about lumber. And uh, I have to make a really an apology to Simon, but I'm, I messed up. And when I hit the setting on Skype, I didn't realize that it was going to cut our screens in half. And so unfortunately you only really get to see about half of simon's face this whole time if you're watching it on youtube and i'm so sorry but he's a really handsome guy his voice comes through perfectly clear and it's a nice view out of his window so simon i'm sorry about that and i'll do better next time for the rest of you who are listening in the just in your headphones you can disregard won't affect you but i hope you enjoy the conversation without any further ado simon from uneducated economist Thank you, first of all, for taking the time to to come on the show with us. And we're going to mostly talk about lumber. Although, before we do, can you, in case the listeners aren't familiar with, uh, with who you are, can you kind of talk about how you got interested in all these topics and what that's been like for you over the last 10 years and two years and sort of give people the quick catch up to, to who you are? Okay. Well, my name is Simon. Uh, I call myself the Uneducated Economist. I started a YouTube channel in November of 2017. Now, I got into economics back pretty much during the great financial crisis. I was working construction, trying to buy a home, had my first kid, and everything just went, went south, right? It was just everything's crashing around me. I had no clue about Federal Reserve, interest rates, mortgage-backed securities, none of this stuff. And so I'm watching the news, trying to figure out what's going on, and I keep hearing credit default swaps and mortgage-backed securities. Mm -hmm. So I just went to Google, and I typed in mortgage-backed securities and credit default swaps, and I just never stopped Googling after that. A buddy of mine came to me one time, and he says, have you ever read or ever heard of the Federal Reserve? Read this book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. And I had never heard of it. He gave me a book that was about this thick. And I'm not very big into reading. Like, I mean, I can count all the books I've ever read on like one hand. But I did manage to get through that book. And once you have read that book, you cannot put that information away. And it just kept me going. So if you knew me personally, you would know that I never stop talking. I just constantly babble about stuff that's on my mind all the time. <laughs> and people like finally, like they sometimes are like, dude, oh, enough is enough, man. Okay. Just, <laughs> <laughs> and they kept telling me, dude, you got to start a blog. You got to start a blog or a podcast or something. And I literally went down one day, fired up my camera, did an introductory video to the uneducated economist and just started making videos. And for the first six months or so, nobody watched, like nobody. Like I would have maybe my mom and my wife and a friend or something watch and maybe put a comment down. But it started catching a little steam as I started talking a little bit more about the housing and lumber markets and stuff like that. And it just started growing. And I started giving my uh, ideas about economics, you know, started to take these complex ideas like the repo market, break it down for people to understand and have a conversation about. And people really enjoy this perspective. So, so yeah, how, to aside from the creature from Jekyll Island, I mean, a lot of this stuff, like myself, I, I'm interested and it makes, and I want to know more, but it's so complicated. And in order to understand something well enough to explain it, it's kind of like a whole different level of comprehension and stuff. So I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe what, what are you, how, how are you absorbing and what's your like research process look like and sources? Mm -hmm. It's, it's really tough for me to like, I don't know, you can't, it's hard to get primary sources for, you know, these things. Although I guess in your, you know, day-to-day -day, you're seeing primary sources in terms of the sticker price of lumber, but. You know, I wish I could give you a list of books that I've read. I mean, I really do. I open up a book, like an economics book that somebody will send me and 
I will start to read. I'll get like a few pages into it and my mind just starts wandering and it just goes <laughs> off in different places. And although my mind, my eyes are reading the pages, my mind is drifting. Yeah. So I found listening to lectures, speeches, uh, other YouTubers out there. That's how I started a lot of my research into things. So if I was confused on something, I would just Google it. And just start reading over and over again and listening to different people's perspective on it until I finally grasped a hold of what it was that they were talking about. Huh. Um, you know, you really, it, you kind of have to just start with the first thing, like read an article. And if you don't understand the very first thing that they're talking about, you just go and start researching that until you understand what they're talking about and go back to the beginning of the article again and start over. And There you go. Wow. Um, it's, you know, you do that over and over again, and pretty soon you're reading articles and you don't have to do the research on what they're talking about anymore. You already know what's what, you know, Got and a, a lot of it, you know, most of it really, uh, to be honest with you, it's not that complicated. The problem with a lot of it is for people is that the language that they use is almost spoken in code. And so when you're listening to them speak, they're saying words that you understand the definition to, but you're not understanding quite how they apply to what it is that they're talking about. And if you don't yes. catch the, the first thing, the rest of it doesn't make any sense. You know? so, yes. so that that is a bigger problem, I think, with a lot of people when it comes to economics. They can understand the 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 core principles of it, you know, the the whole outline. But when somebody is speaking and they start talking about you know, say sovereign debt, and somebody doesn't understand that that means that it's a corporate or a government bond. They think uh -huh. that that might be two different things. You know, yes. that's 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 a, you know where a lot of people end up missing out on on a lot of the research they can do. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And or or something like it, sometimes it seems like these terms are almost deliberately <laughs> complex, like quantitative easing. When it finally clicked, what that was i was just kind of annoyed that yeah. that's the way they chose to frame it and they and they did that on purpose you notice they don't use quantitative easing anymore they call it asset purchases so uh, that's another point right. they will change the terms occasionally as they could go in and out of style or as people figure out what they're talking about so i guess i didn't realize that did you say troubled asset purchase what they no, call it, it now asset purchases oh, okay like the <laughs> asset purchases yeah. The quantitative easing, asset purchases, uh, balance sheet expansion. That's all yeah. the same thing. Yeah. You know, that's all. I mean, that's, you know, when they say these things, that's, they're talking about the exact same thing. But a lot of, you know, I mean, that's not easy to understand, you know, if you're, if you're not privy already. So can you maybe just about your uh, channel and getting started, those first six months where there weren't a lot of people watching and you were kind of doing these vlogs still, what was that like? And how that is, it's not that easy to do that, um, you know, to cr take the time to create this content. And I'm sure now you're getting hundreds of thousands of views and all this feedback and it's, it's probably a lot easier, but can you talk about what it was like kind of when you're starting and how you were motivated to keep doing that and what was going through your head at that time? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it, to be honest with you, you have to be a little insane, a little obsessive compulsive about <laughs> things. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense to put out videos onto something and have nobody listen or watch. I mean, that doesn't, it's like, you know, you're, you're putting these videos out as if somebody's listening, but nobody's listening, you know, I mean, does that, you know, are you, are you nuts? You know? Yeah. But I looked at things and I thought about it for a little bit and I thought, you know, if nothing else, I am doing these videos for myself so that I would have reference to the things that I was thinking about at the time. Yeah. And so if nobody listened, like at the time I thought if nobody listens to this, at least I'll have recordings of what I was doing, like what I was thinking instead of like, I put down notes on in notebooks and stuff. I can't find those notebooks anymore. <laughs> like, I, you know, like all the things that I was writing about quantitative easing mm -hmm. six years ago, I don't know where they are. I mean, they're all gone, but these videos, they will be here forever. I mean, well, maybe yeah. not, but they could be here forever. Yeah. So that's really where my motivation came in. And then also like, I, did get a few people like after a few weeks there was a couple of people who would you know throw a few comments down or something like that that was motivating like once i started having just a couple of viewers just saying hey please keep up the videos i really appreciate them yeah. that's all i need i just had a half a dozen people or a dozen people that i'm like okay i'll make videos for you guys i mean if you know yeah. not everybody else it's just us then 
and it just kept going. Yeah. You know, I never, I never tried to, I never tried to, to make, like, I didn't have this idea in my mind. It's like, man, I'm going to go for 50,000 subscribers. I'm going to, like this, you know, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have any goal. Like my whole goal, literally my whole goal when I started the channel, other than to put information out there, content out there was I wanted Google to pay me $100. That's <laughs> it. That was my whole goal. My buddy had done yeah. it like a couple of years earlier. And I'm like, man, I'm going to do that too. I'm going to get a hundred dollars. Yeah. You just watch and see. And yeah. a couple of years later it happened. And I thought I'm going to do that again. Yeah. Go. That's really cool. It, I was, we did a, I did an interview with these young guys on this we had a, a great podcast called laying foundations. And they asked a question kind of like the, that, like, you know, in terms of growth. And I, I was thinking about myself and even with this show right now, where, while we do have some people who watch and listen, really, I'm kind of doing it for myself also in terms of practicing and getting better at communicating and having less fear, uh, speaking to a camera and putting yourself out there to contact people you otherwise wouldn't have. Those uh, skills are, are kind of just breaking the ice on doing some of those things just for yourself can be really valuable. In other, so in your case, do you feel separate from having more of an audience? Have you, in what ways have you improved or, or gotten better just from the practice over the last few years of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, uh, luckily for me, being in front of an audience wasn't, was something I'm very comfortable with. I have been entertaining on the weekends, uh, doing a, I call bingo right at the local tavern. And sometimes I'll have up to 50 players and really I try to make a show out of it. Like, you know, we do a lot of comedy. We try to do a lot of, you know, audience interaction and stuff like that. So every weekend I had, I was the center of attention for two and a half hours huh. every weekend for 10 years. Huh. I, I mean, yeah, being, being the center of attention is like, I love it. I like being in a room and making noise and everybody's focused in on me and stuff. I, I mean, I don't like be embarrassing or anything like that, but sure. I, I just, you know, I mean, I'm in the yeah. middle of it, which is really odd because like having one-on-one -on -one conversations with like, you know, this, yeah. sometimes it's like a little, like, I, I don't feel as comfortable doing stuff like that. That as is I so am. interesting. Yeah, so isn't that kind of fun? That is you know? so interesting and, and insightful. Wow. Yeah. That's and really so, crazy. Yeah. And, and then, so like being in front of a camera, like when I'm doing my videos, I really feel like I'm talking to somebody like, yeah. I mean, Sometimes, I mean, I screw up the video. I have to do them again because I, I do them all in one shot. I don't do any edits or anything. So, like, if I realize I had said something wrong, I have to stop the video and do it again. But really, when I'm talking to the camera, I really do feel like I have somebody in the passenger seat here and I'm trying to, you know, and start a conversation or explain something or just kind of get it out there. And so, yeah, so, like, I start really getting nervous when the videos start getting really popular. Like, all of a sudden, like, I put a video out yesterday and all of a sudden boom boom it's got twenty thousand views inside of just a few hours and i'm thinking man that's too much i don't like it. you know and i yeah. don't want i would rather it be like kind of a gradual thing because that's really how the channel started and what it's mm -hmm. like having like an instantaneous bang really popular that's not like that's a little more than i was anticipating you know, yeah you're stuff. like what did i say in there i need to go listen and make yeah. sure i didn't say anything that's like, gonna <laughs> yeah. regret <laughs> and i'm like oh my god what did i say you know <laughs> yeah that's exactly so, what to some extent, the, the lumber market and, and spotlight is, it's kind of unbelievable. And at this point, it's, it's, I'll say it's old news, but people should know by now that lumber has just blown up over the last, I guess, year and a half or two years. Do you want to mm -hmm. just catch people up? And it's changing daily. And I know even right now, there's, there's uh, changes happening. So do you, should we kind of get into that yeah. a little bit and, and catch yeah. people up? Maybe assume that you're, that some guys listening who aren't buying lumber every day who have just been hearing lumber in the periphery, but what's been going on? Well, let's talk about some of the price changes. Now I, my, I work at a lumber yard. I do retail sales for a living. Now I'm way out here on the coast of Oregon and we sell two by fours. They're pretty high priced. A two by four, eight right now sells for around $13. It's pretty expensive considering just a few years ago, they were selling for around two and a half, three dollars. So two by fours have just gone off the charts. Now, there is a lot of reasonings for this, but ultimately what it comes down to is the supply chain crunch. And it's not just like mills holding back on supply. It was mill shutdowns that were taking place long before the COVID and all that was going on. 
So we could go back like years and years ago, but really I'm just going to go back to just prior to 2000, to the end of 2019, just prior to COVID. And Canada was going through mill curtailments. They had a situation where a bug infestation had killed off a huge chunk of their forest. They went into the salvage mode where they were harvesting more than what they would typically do. And they were milling that up and sending it down to the United States. When that salvage mode came to an end, it shut down that region. The British Columbia area was done and a mill started like shutting down production completely and closing. Wait, I'm, now, I'm not you, following. So be, because they burned through all that bug infested wood and, and there was uh, the, the bugs just killed the forest. So the, the lumber resource wasn't available anymore the way it had for the last 50 years for that reason. That's exactly right. So what ended up happening was, is that they, they had a pretty much a glut of logs that came through because of this, you know, bug infestation. When that salvage mode ended and they went back to what they would typically be operating at, the log prices, the stumpage fee is what they called it, was so expensive for the loggers, getting those logs from the distance that they were all the way to the mill was no longer profitable. Uh -huh. So they had, they were just saying, okay, well, we're done in business around here. There was a place up there called Hundred Mile. That was all they had up there was mills and trees and timber. And that's, that's it. And when they shut down, when there was no longer profit to be made there because of this salvage mode ending and the stumpage fees going up, they shut down. There was nothing else up there for them. Now, when these mills shut down, it started crunching the inventory. Like the inventory depletions really started taking place. And you can find where they were like forcefully doing this. They even said that they were curtailing development because the prices were dropping so dramatically at the time. Mm -hmm. So prices had run up really high. They got up to like six fifty per thousand, which at the time was very expensive. These Canadian mills were pumping out a lot of lumber. That whole situation ended. Prices started to churn. Mills were shutting down and the curtailments kicked in and the inventories depletions. Then COVID kicked in more inventory depletions with the mills shutting down production thinking that nobody was going to be buying lumber right nobody was going to be building everybody's going to be locked down at home there was going to be no interest in this and so lumber yards supply chains i mean the distribution hubs everybody just depleted their inventories down including the mills so they were already sitting on tight inventory and then they pushed it even further everybody's sitting at home locked down and they get a COVID stimulus check Man, the deck packages, the fence packages, the remodeling, the boom and lumber just kicked in dramatically and it literally wiped out the inventory. Now, in my yard, I, my personal, like what I like to sell is deck packages. I'm not into the house packages like a couple of the other guys do there. I'm more of the retail end. And summertime, like this time of year, I push out more deck packages than in any time of year. This is the deck season. Last year at this time, I ran out of pressure treated. Had no four by fours, no two by sixes. The the deck would depleted. Like it was gone for months. I would get a unit here and there, just occasionally would pop in. Wow. Right. So time goes on for a little bit. Eventually, you know, the supply starts picking up and we start getting our pressure treated in. But the prices just keep going and they just keep going up and up and up. So now here I have like a full yard. It's not like completely full. I have, but all my all the pressure treated units are there. And the prices are just off the charts. Well, what happened was, is that this inventory depletion with this huge boom in, in demand has, has caused trouble with the mills, the remaining mills here, filling that supply chain back up. So although the mills are pumping out as much lumber as they could possibly do, filling in that distribution hubs and filling in that supply chain and filling up the lumber yards at a time when the summer is kicking in and building season is starting has just created a very difficult situation for them. But the inventory levels are starting to rise and the prices are starting to come down. So that's kind of like the short story of yeah. a very long, complicated situation. Yeah. A couple points. Have you heard or is there are any of these mills that shut down in Canada, let's say from a couple of years ago, are are investors seeing an opportunity to make a killing now that prices are high? Because if they couldn't survive when it was, you know, 250 for a two by four fair and they couldn't ship the logs in fair enough. But Right. I, I know it's tough to start a mill up. You can't just, it's not like flipping on a light switch, but have you heard of mills like coming back online or anything? Yeah, absolutely. So what happened was, is that these mills, I mean, you think about it. Um, a guy explained it kind of like a fisherman, you know, a fisherman goes where the fish are. So 
these mills up in up in Canada, they were having issues getting logs to the mills, so they shut down the mills. But these Canadian mills, they're not done. They set up camp down in the, the southern part of the United States, where there's a whole bunch of pine growing right now. So these Canadian mills are now operating down in the southern part of the United States. And I just read where another one has uh, has purchased four more mills that they plan on opening up and running. <laughs> so these mills, these Canadian, yeah, like, you know, a lot of people are like, Okay, so just recently there was another tariff. That's like, why I'm laughing because because the, the they're trying to uh, <laughs> tax those Canadians, but they just you're saying they just bought their mills tax, locally. Then tax them all you want, they don't matter. They're down here in the United States huh. pumping it up. So it's yeah. yeah, that like I laughed when I read that because it was just like, well, I don't think you're really hurting those Canadian companies yeah, considering that's that amazing. If you keep these prices elevated, that just benefits them. So they're yeah. not sad one little bit. You know, huh. <laughs> I so, don't think. I, I, I don't say it's like a rumor, but I've definitely read a lot of, co- even just comments, but there's definitely an instinct to people think that these, these lumber mills are making a killing and they're price gouging. And this is who's getting rich off of this. Is that, is there anything to that, you know, line of thinking that it's, you know, comes down to um, lumber yeah. owners, greedy price gouging or anything like that, or is that nonsense? I, I'm I'm going to push to nonsense, but it's not doesn't mean that the lumber mill owners aren't like rolling fat cats right now getting into it. But I mean, it just happens to be that they're in a really lucky situation. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you think about it. These are a lot of mills out there that can make this stuff. OK, yeah. it's not just like, you know, five guys who are like, haha, look what we can do. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of mills out there. I mean, they're yes. all over the place. And if I was one of these small time mills, I'd be loving it too. Right. Yeah, I And mean, it's commodity. Like your, your two by four is not like, you know, inherently different than it, tech, not supposed to be than another well, one. So, I mean, if you have like a standard and better dug for two by four, that's going to be the same as the standard and better dug for two by four that that guy makes. Right. I mean, they, you know, I mean, sure the qualities and everything else, like personal preference over, it might be a little bit there, but you know, on the bottom line of lump, they're not going to, you know, right. that doesn't change the price of it at all. So I, I, I mean, nobody was like, everybody's screaming at these guys for making a bunch of money, but nobody was like, you know, feeling sorry for them when it was at two fifty per thousand and they were shutting their mills down. I mean, nobody was like, going, Oh God, guys, look, what can we do for you? You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, making up for lost time, I don't blame them one little bit. I mean, that's the American way. Like, I, I'm, I'm cool with it. Yeah. What I'm not cool with is the idea that you can manipulate markets. And that's where, you know, I think probably the real concern would come in is that, is there a manipulation of the market taking place or is this really just a series of unfortunate events that took place? I mean, if it does turn out to be market manipulation, well, then that is something to be upset over because really these are people's livelihoods out here. This is, you know, this is somebody's home. This is somebody's construction job. I mean, to, to manipulate it to the situation where it is now is very damaging. I mean, there's very few homes being built right now with a lot of like confidence that there's going to be a profit behind it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of like nervousness when it comes to new construction right now. And that's not a pleasant place to be. Yeah. I mean, when you say manipulate, do you mean, are you referring to like a tariff pushing the price up higher than it should be? And like taking mills offline that, that type or, or something more like, sinister from like mill owners or what, what What do you mean by that i mean well i mean yeah i mean it could be like you know the because i mean they ultimately said it prior to the code like at the end of 2019 we are curtailing development to cause the prices to go up yeah yeah i mean that's i they straight up said it yeah <laughs> so right. i'm is is that manipulation right there um another point on this before we move on that i feel like it gets lost is if there was a real like windfall happening here, like somebody getting rich. It seems like that would be the people who own the land the timber grows on because the price of logs is also really high. And these mills, I know a lot of them own the timber also. So fair enough. But there's also a lot of the mills that just buy logs off log trucks. And I'm guessing the cost of buying a load of logs has gone up (laughs) along with the price of the lumber that they spit out on the other end, right? I mean, they have they have um, to buy raw materials in order to sell their product. And those, the price of those raw materials has to be going up as well. Is that right? Uh, well, I'm just curious on the log question now, or did you assume that or did you read that somewhere? Well, no, I just know that like uh, around here in Roseburg, these mills, 
that logging, let's say a logging operation, a logging, logging contractor, they'll go to a mill and work mm-hmm. out a deal. You want to buy, you want to buy logs from me? I'm going to be logging in this neighborhood. Yeah. Da, 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 let's work out a deal. And they work out a deal and there's a scaler who appraises the logs every time. And we had a guy on the show um, who works at one of these mills and he kind of explained how there's a almost like Kelly blue book for logs that is updated every week. It's called random lengths, I believe. And how, you know, all these mills and logging operators are looking at that every day. Like what, what are these things selling for? And so, yes, the lumber is high, but the price of logs and probably timberland and real estate and dirt that can grow logs is also uh, rising in price. Right. Well, I, I would assume that, you know, that, just because of everything else going up that the price of land and logs would go up, you know, somewhat too. But from what I was reading and from what I was gathering that the price of logs and what the loggers are getting is not nearly in the same percentage of what the increase in lumber has done. And in fact, from what I was gathering down in that Southern area where all those Canadian mills had moved to that, they're getting the same price for their logs that they were getting like 10 years ago. And right. Because of a glut of logs that are down there. Right. There's too many, like these people had this projection, you know, 20 years ago that there was going to be this demand for lumber coming into the future. And so they planted all these trees. So now there's this glut of trees down there that they all need to mill all these mills. And this is another, this is another really sad story for this guy. These mills are now really automated. They want a a log that's this big, you know, they want it this big and this long and they want all of them to be that way. And there's this farmer down there, this landowner he saved from cutting his trees from way back in the great financial crisis. He didn't cut back then when he should have, he's held onto his trees all the way up till now. Well, these trees are huge and the mill doesn't want them. They're like, your trees are too. Oh, we'll buy them, but we're buying them full price. We don't want them for lumber. Interesting. It's like, my gosh, I sat on this for this long, grew these huge trees and now the mills don't want them. And well, he's thinking walking in that he's just going to make a killing because lumber prices are at like an all time high. And in actuality, Um, it could be that those lumber prices aren't touching logs. Maybe, maybe my like, like little thesis is just not right there and they're not matching. Wow. Now, here's the other thing you know, our area. I mean, we're in the same area here. How many logs roll out the river and over to China? Yeah. Think about. Think about during the this the last year, there was all kinds of tariffs and trade wars and everything else happening. China gave us the finger on logs, huh. right? And so yeah. we have a lot of loggers here all of a sudden with a bunch of trees on the ground and no place to go with them. So those trees had to find a way back to these mills, and now they're getting back up and running again since you know over the last what six seven months or so. Wow. So from what I understood last year, I mean, I was talking to one of my buddies who operates a a yarder he said that he was uh sweeping the shop floor he said the first time he had ever in his life since we were in high school that he had ever swept the shop floor <sighs> at, at a logging operation because wow because wow. they had no control that day in other yeah. words the, the this is a lumber uh issue not logs or timber right. it's lumber wow it's lumber it's a lumber and like i said now right now he says he's working like they're probably right. they're the place right and I crossed over to Longview the other day and that sorting yard that's just on the other side over there in Washington. Yeah. I have never seen so many logs in that place. Like it is pouring out of that yard. Yeah. And I mean, I've driven over that thing, you know, for 20 years and there's sometimes there's a lot of logs there. Not like I've ever seen it right now. Interesting. You know, and then one more, um, as if we needed more evidence, but these forest Mm -hmm. fires that ripped through, I learned from this fellow who I'll, I'll link to it, and I'm probably going to call him right after this just to update my information. But there is a period of time after a forest fire where where a lot of those burned logs can be sawed and put on market. And so around here, when you drive up the river in the forest fire area, it is log city deluxe. I mean, they're just equipment everywhere, and they've been going nuts. I think they're they're getting through it, but one more. Um, source of logs rolling at rolling down the mountains into these into these mills that's just mm-hmm. amazing yeah so this is really what has come down to so like a lot of people are like man they should build these mills they should get these mills up and running well once this supply chain is filled uh, and it's done uh, there won't there won't be the issues that we have right now 
I mean, lumber is flowing through the system. Logs are like coming through the, like everything is operating. It's just a matter of getting this inventory level back up to where it just functions properly. Yeah. You know, I, this, I think it's just a matter of time, you know? So why, and, why would other building materials or tools and other, there's a lot of things that get involved with building a deck, you know, yeah. you gotta, you gotta buy like masonry string and all, all kinds of stuff. And how come other building materials haven't or I guess a better question is, have other building materials been jumping uh, as well? I know they don't have the same issues with, with the log and timber industry, but in general, is this kind of happening to other building materials that, that you're seeing windows and doors and asphalt shingles and all this kind of stuff? Yes and no. When it comes to doors and windows, yes, it is. Now, I thought about this for a little bit because this is a manufacturing product. And if you laid off a bunch of employees and now you're having trouble getting your employees back, then you're going to have manufacturing issues. So there was also supply chain breakdowns from like global supplies coming in to assemble these things. Windows and doors, that's like a manufactured product that you have to order. Now, those things have gone up 20% or so over the course of a year, 25, and the lead times on them have stretched out dramatically. But then you have other products like fiber cement siding. And 15 pound felt, felt paper, asphalt, impregnated felt, they haven't changed a bit. Not one penny have I seen any of those products move. Now, I thought about that for a little bit. And I'm like, well, it's probably in the manufacturing of this stuff. There's a lot of automation, right? There's probably doesn't take a lot of people to make this stuff. Yep. And the raw products going into it, although it's like a cement base and like, a, you know, an asphalt kind of product, probably not terribly in short supply. So the automation yep. and lack of short supply, the prices haven't changed. The availability, on the siding is getting difficult. We ordered a truckload, which normally takes two weeks to get. It's taken six weeks on this one, mm. which is very, very uh, odd, you know, to say the least mm -hmm. when it comes to like, the history of ordering this stuff. But considering what lumber has done, we, we weren't surprised by it at all. Wow. And then when, you know, when you order it, so like you can order your truckloads, like you order from the factory or you can order like piece count from the warehouse is what you call it. So you find a vendor in Portland who's willing to sell to you. Now, get at this. This is, this is kind of strange on how quickly it moves. I called a vendor on Monday. They were like, oh yeah, we got loads. Of it. I got 25 units for sale right now on this particular site. I'm like, great. The next day I called him. He was like, dude, I got three. Called him 20 minutes later. They were gone. Right. <laughs> so I was Whoa. like, whoa. Man, that moved, right? When do you get your next truck? I get it on Friday, you know? So it's like, it's gone like immediately. People are filling their inventory levels back up. We're out of the siding. We're waiting for our truck, you know? So, I mean, we're not completely out. We're down to our last few units here, but this is how quickly this stuff is moving along. And from what I understand, that is a trucking issue. It's not a manufacturing issue. It's not a, you know, anything else. Right. It's just transportation. So right. at some point that will free up. You know? Yes. That is really interesting. Okay. So, um, changing the topic slightly, you've been around contractors and building materials, and I know you've worked, uh, in the trades yourself as well. And, and I'm sure you have a lot of listeners and emailers, people contacting you like, Oh, I'm interested in, you know, working in the trades in this way. Can you talk about some of the things you've seen among contractors that the really successful ones who are been there for decades, you know, what kind of separates those from the the ones who, who kind of wash out, it's a tough trade. It's a tough industry. Do you have anything to say about what, what it takes for a contractor to weather all of these just uncertain uncertainties that, you know, exist? And maybe, maybe to um, wrap this in also, we didn't really mention it fairly, but the contractors are really taking a beating on this lumber issue. And it's, they're, they're, they don't even get much sympathy, but can you imagine having the, the contracts to write, to build a custom, beautiful custom home and it's inks all dry and then be on the hook for if the contract was not <laughs> written properly, I guess, but they, 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 they've been taking a beating. I'm sure some of them. Um, yeah. And I've hearing, I'm hearing of contracts. I'm, I'm hearing of contractors backing out, like paying what, I mean, if there was like, you know, a, a deposit fine fee, whatever, mm. you know, I'm here like contractors backing out cause they simply can't, you know, pay they can't they can't make this contract valuable no matter what they do no matter what cuts they make what labor whatever they do they cannot make the contract valuable and they're backing out of it or they're getting to try to get the customer to renegotiate 
Now, most customers who want the house are going to have to renegotiate on it because if they back out it completely, they're going to have a hard time finding another contractor who's going to come remotely close to, you know, mm-hmm. bidding it for what the original one was. I have no clue. I've asked a bunch of contractors, how are you handling this? All of them say the same thing. We got a clause in our contract to deal with the price increases. So ultimately it's coming down on the customer on whether or not they want to pay that price increase on, on projects. That's what I found a lot of them. What kind of gets me is how does a builder give a quote for a house and then that person takes that quote to a bank and then tries to get a loan for that. And by the time they get back to signing the contract, prices have moved so much that it's no longer the same numbers. That question I've asked a bunch of people and nobody can give me a good answer on that, on how to handle that things. Because the prices move so fast that there's no way you can guarantee anything for a month. Ew. Well, um, I'm guessing that the banks are relying on the appraisal increasing as real estate prices move pretty rapidly. Maybe they're able to adjust the appraised value of the house and justify lending the higher price to meet the well, building costs. The new construction loans is kind of what I'm because I mean I'm not terribly familiar with new construction loans, but I thought they were kind of based off of like you know the estimate of the construction of the house. I mean, yeah. like the estimate of the material on the builders. You well, know. they are, but they, and I only know this because I'm working on one to some extent, but they, they actually do an appraisal on the, the land and the house and the plans and, and the appraiser is able to kind of, and somebody chime in and correct me. I, I could be, I'm way out of my lane, but in any case, they'll, they'll, they'll come up with a number like this house will be worth this. Therefore, that's how you, Mr. Bank can lend up to 20% of this. And there you're still in your, you know your, your right. limit there. So I'm just wondering if they're, w- if they have to go back to the bank and they're like, we need another hundred thousand dollars. Um, I wonder if they can check with that appraiser and be like, Hey, it's been a year. Is right. there room have things, you know what I mean? Cause re- in other words, real estate prices are also moving uh, pretty rapidly, super rapidly in some areas. And that's, that's all it's tied together. You know, the, the real estate industry is very connected to construction in terms Absolutely. of supply and demand and, and all of this. Yeah. I mean, but that was, that was just something that I was kind of curious about. Never really did get a straight answer on it. I mean, that would be what ultimately we would have to come down to. It was just like, I mean, we ran out of money, like the material was more than what we thought it was going to be. We can't, you know, we need more material. And that's ultimately what it comes down to, I would assume. Yeah. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to get a, I'm going to try to get a logger type of fellow on the show to ask some of these uh, deeper questions and maybe a construction lender also, we can get a little more um, straight from the source. So about tradesmen and contractors, it's not an easy business. And uh, you've seen a lot of these guys. And and what do you say to someone who's kind of heading that direction? And do you have any advice for those, you know, those folks? Yeah. um, You know, I guess probably the number one thing I would say is, is that there's never been a time in history that there was no construction taking place. There's always somebody who needs a house built or worked on or remodeled or repaired or something. So there's always some form of construction always taking place. Whether or not you can get the job, that's the, you know, that would be the other question about it. I have seen a lot of people fly by night. They will come in and they will talk a big game. They will, you know, have a bunch of jobs that they will do, but then they're gone. And I wonder like, you know, what happened? Were they really like, do they really know what they were doing? Did they make the customers mad? You know, like what happened there to, to those people? Cause I don't see them anymore. Other guys I've seen them my whole life since, I mean, I've been doing this since I was 18 years old. They're still building. They drive this old pickup truck. They have the old tools. There's nothing flashy about them. Mm-hmm. You know, other guys, I see them come in, you know, a couple of years later, they're completely logoed out. Their truck is logo, their trailer's logo. They got jackets and hats and all the other stuff going on. And I thought, man, how deep in the debt did you go to do all that? You know, yeah. I mean, this is like, is that going to get you the sale? Are you trying to sell your jobs or, yeah. you know, is, you know, what is, what's going on here? So I think about all those kind of things when I watch people go through and when you're running up, when things are really busy, like, you know, 2018, was just an incredible year. I mean, to me, like there was so much going on. There was so many people working and it was just crazy. It was a good time. Like I, I sold a lot of deck packages that year. It was just good. And, um, I was amazed by how many of these, like, I just going to call them unlicensed, you know, but it's kind of the handyman ish kind of people who are Uh coming in and like every day. And 
And I knew something, you know, something is up because they come in and they ask you how to order a window. Uh huh. I'm thinking, okay, wait a minute. You just bid this job out. Like you already got the money and the deposit and you don't know how to order a window. Huh. What's going on? Like, and I realized, well, you worked for a construction company for a year. You've done a couple of, you know, like repairs. Uh-huh. You have some tools. You can talk enough to get the job. And there is such a desperation for people to do work out there at the time yeah. that they would get these jobs. So, you know, when it comes to like the new construction, working for a good contractor or a good company and really learning those skills and being involved in that for years is really where you need to start i mean going to work for yourself after having just done a remodel on a job to me it it i've seen them come and go and that's the only thing like i watched a guy you know a kid who worked on a framing crew for five years started his own framing company and now he's you know that's what he does and I mean, he spent five years pushing a crew around and learned how to learn the business really well. He learned the mistakes that were made and stuff, you know? So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a difficult business to be in. Um, you know, I've watched a lot of guys who, who, uh, spend the money as soon as it comes in, like they take the deposit for things and then pretty soon they're like jumbling jobs, you know, they're trying to take material from one job and go over to another. And, you know, once you kind of get into that position, it's just a matter of time before you start to fail. So I guess like if I was to ever give any kind of suggestion out there, it would be like, you know, for one, most of the time from what I hear, the biggest complaint from customers is that the contractor just doesn't stay in communication. Mm -hmm. So if you're in good, close communication with your customer, you're honest with them, you know, don't get on over your head. If it's a project that's beyond your capabilities, don't do it. You know, because once you get your name out there and they have a bad name, it's going to be hard to get other jobs, you know, so do the jobs you're confident with. I mean, that's the only thing I say, be in close communication with your lumber yards, your, your, your suppliers, because those guys will get you a lot of jobs as well. And they will make your job a whole lot easier as far as getting the material to you. You know, if you're a pain in the ass with them, they will be a pain in the ass with you. Yeah. So, you know, if you, you know, if you're constantly yelling and beating them up and trying to get a better price and all that, then you're going to have a hard time getting your deliveries on time. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, but being in communication with them, you know, being, you know, understanding and, you know, listening to the customers, and what they want and stuff. It's a very, it's a very profitable business to be in. I mean, you can make a lot of money doing this and it's not hard. But it is easy to get in over your head and it is easy to get greedy. Yeah, it's like it's like it's simultaneously it's very simple. People have been builders for centuries and everybody can understand how the business works. You you buy materials, you build something, you get paid. So it's deceptive. You know, it's it seems simple. Everybody knows there's a lot of hard work. Most most contractors aren't scared of that part, but there's some real complexities that can I'm sure there's a lot of really great builders who washed out you know for all of the other reasons and complexities you know separate from building it's almost like the buildings it can be the easy part the work is the, the easy part it's it's all the rest of it well hey last question i want to ask you and you may not have like j- the an answer off the top of your head but i am very i'll say impressed but doing what you do and vlogging in this way is i'll say risky business because you're you're kind of ha- having to think on your feet and make predictions you know and sometimes you you had to make predictions, you know, in a month or two or a year out. Have there been predictions you've made that have come true that you're really like, I knew that was going to happen or one way or the other? Or is there something you are still kind of waiting for someday? This is going to happen. Or do you just kind of post your videos and never go back and just say, hey, it's all just entertainment and speculation anyways? Or how, how, do, how do you navigate, you know, kind of putting it out publicly? This, I think, X, Y, Z, you know, that that would be hard for me. Um. Yeah. You know, I just, I, I'm not trying to sell anything, so it's easy for me. Like, I don't have anything to sell and yeah. whatever it is. And I'm like, you know, if I'm wrong on it, I mean, that's, you know, I'm wrong. I didn't, you know, I don't lose anything. Now I try to tell people, you know, when you take my information, you have to take it in conjunction with a lot of other information out there. Just use it. Like if you just listen to me or just listen to that person or just, you're not, you know, that's not the way you do it. You gotta, you know, you gotta listen to a broad spectrum of people. Yeah, I put out and that is very different from everybody else because like i try to think outside of what 
the view is like everybody looks at it this way and i try to step back and say okay well what about it from this way you know and sometimes i'm really wrong on things like i'm just like way out of left field on things other stuff like it just seems as plain as day like it is going to occur like i have very little doubt in my mind that we are moving to a central bank digital currency very little doubt like it's gonna happen cash will be removed from the system how long that takes i have no idea but it will occur yeah you know now people can say that's a prediction but it's more of like to me it's just an inevitability it's just heading that way we're already you know we're stepping towards that ground yep so a lot of you know i mean i don't i don't call that a prediction i just you know it's just yeah. that's way it but a couple of years ago when i was saying that people were calling it a prediction because there was no talk about central bank digital currencies china hadn't introduced theirs yet or anything but you know you listen to enough of the imf and the Bureau of International Settlements talking about negative interest rates and how cash is going to be a nuisance during that, you know, they're going to move to a digital currency. It's just going to happen. Yep. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I see this a lot of times where after something, an idea has been like in the periphery long enough, then, you know, the day before they announce it, they can say like, or the day after they announce it, like, oh yeah, we've been talking about it. Everybody knew this was coming. It's like, okay, yeah, yesterday, but like you said, two years ago, and at the time, it, people were really like, "No, that that'll never happen," or X, Y, you know. So uh, that's a really good example of uh, of that, and that's be fun to talk all about that. And um, so I'm gonna let you go, but hey, thanks so much. Now, our for the listeners, you put your vlogs on YouTube, but they are also released as a podcast, and they can be consumed there super well since it's pretty much a you know vlog format. Is there anything? Or anywhere else the viewers should go, or what's the best way for them to kind of tune into your your stuff? Um, I'm pretty much active on YouTube. Um, I do have the uneducatedeconomist.com website, so all my videos get posted there. I try to do some writings um, occasionally. I've been trying to do one a week, but I got kind of busy this last week. I post those over to Patreon first, and then a week later I'll move them over to the website. I'm on Facebook and Twitter and all the other places, but pretty much I'm active on YouTube and that's where I do most of my comments and everything else. Um, the uh, podcast, uh, I have a friend of mine, Chandler, she uploads, she takes the videos and immediately uploads them to the podcast. So those are usually up within 24 hours of the video coming out. So yeah, if people wanted to listen to, to the podcast, you can certainly find them over there. And but, it's the same, um, it's the same content. It's the same vlog, right? It's just sort of put audio only into the podcast, right? Yeah, because a lot of people told me they would rather listen to listen to the videos, um, mm -hmm. like when they're done or something like that. So we moved them over to a podcast and they could listen to the videos there. That was really cool. Yeah. You know, my the way I've been enjoying your um, material is I like to ask as many people a lot of these topics, but not very many people are interested. You know, some people would rather talk about sports or, you know, whatever other thing that matters. But in terms of like pred making predictions and stuff, it's like we're we're all doing that all the time. I am as well. You know, I'll tell my wife or a friend, like, oh, I think I'm going to, you know, buy a bunch of this, you know, toilet paper a year ago because whatever it is. So it's it's very normal to be thinking that way. And it's nice to get as many p opinions on that as you can. Then you can kind of formulate your own perception of like a connect the dots for you. Like, well, based on all of this feedback and these people saying this, this, I think for me, this is the right, you know, way that it'll work for me to allocate my whether it's investment or just understanding of the world and so having that feedback from someone in maybe another part of the country with a very similar uh industry is super valuable you know one more kind of dot in that connect the dot for people to calculate and make decisions that are huge to them and and little bits of feedback from lots of people is super valuable yeah well i to be honest, I look at every, like, somebody's telling me a story. They're like, oh, yeah, my cousin, he's building down in Texas. Oh, yeah, what's he doing down there? What does what he build? What does he do? Exactly. Yes. You know, you know. Exactly. Texas, you know. And that's, that's the way I do everything. Like, I, I mean, I keep my eye out on everything. I, I It's kind of nice having this store to work at because, like, you get so much information, like, real-time information, how many people are coming through, buying, whatever. And last year, as the supply chains really started to break down, I started buying stuff that I knew was going to come up in short supply ahead of time, like canning jars and lids. Yep. Like I bought a bunch of that stuff as I saw the you know the depletion taking place. I could see the inventory levels dropping, so I'm like, 
oh man, everybody's canning this year. So I nabbed up on a bunch of that stuff and I was offered three times the price for it. I was like, man, I should have bought a lot more of this. To me, that's not price gouging. That was like, you know, just being in the right place at the right time and seeing the opportunity. Yeah. So my, my wife, she works at grocery. I tell her the same thing. I said, let me know if you see a bunch of stuff coming through the line. Let me know what it is. She, she will. She'd be like, man, everybody's buying like whatever, you know, flour today. You know? Wow. Wow. Why flowers? I don't know, but everybody bought flower today. You know? Yeah, you got to get her to do like the grocery economist. I want to hear. I want to hear all of that as well. That's really insightful I, and interesting. All the time, like I knew this year was going to be the year of composite decking. I knew it because the price of the two by six outdoor wood was going up so much that it was getting closer and closer to the cedar price, and then I saw the cedar price is going up closer to the composite price, and I'm like, for a few dollars more, you can get composite decking. Yep. That other stuff isn't going to sell. Composite decking is going to be big this year. Man, is it? Just look at Trex deck right now. Look at the stock on Trex. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. And then, therefore, all the tools and drill bits and thing that goes with installing that marches right along with it. Well, Simon, hey, thanks so much for taking an hour of your day, time out of your uh, own content production schedule. And we'll link to all this in the description. And uh, hopefully, once uh, maybe a if there's big changes on on these lumber on this lumber situation, we'll we'll check in with you again. But for the listeners, can't recommend your content enough, and look forward to talking to you again. And I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.